Hello and welcome to Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevard Natsa. The end of the Cold War brought hope of elimination of nuclear weapons, but 25 years later, the nuclear arsenals of global powers are still on alert, and the danger of fatal accident is as high as ever. Theodore Postel, former advisor to the U.S. Chief of Naval Operations, MIT professor and nuclear technology expert, he joins me today to shed light on all of this. Fears of nuclear confrontation faded at the end of the Cold War, but a breakdown in relations between the global powers has reignited fears surrounding atomic weapons. In an atmosphere of mistrust, could a wrong move or a simple accident trigger an exchange of deadly blows? What is the chance of such a fatal error of judgment, and what can be done to turn back the doomsday clock? Dr. Theodore Postel, former advisor to the U.S. Chief of Naval Operations, a professor at MIT, nuclear technology expert. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us. So, Ted, President Obama came into the White House calling for a global zero. Now, there are plans to spend a trillion dollars on an overall of an entire U.S. nuclear arsenal. Why is this happening? Well, I think uh, this is a consequence of uh, domestic politics. Uh, you can never understand the foreign policy of a country without understanding its domestic situation. And in this case, the domestic politics has uh, caused Mr. Obama to decide, uh, frankly, I, I think incorrectly, uh, that uh, he has to modernize the uh, U.S. arsenal in order to avoid being criticized for not being concerned about the defense of the country. Now, do you believe the U.S. is readying its nuclear forces for direct confrontation with Russia? Do you think nuclear war is possible now? At any scenario, do you see that? I do think that uh, an accidental nuclear war between the United States and Russia is possible. Uh, I don't know how likely it is. Uh, anyone who says they know how likely it is has no idea what they're talking about. So, But I think any possibility is too high. So in that sense, I do think uh, we are in danger. I think uh, the current political confrontation between Russia and the West, in particular the United States, is potentially dangerous too. Both sides are very aware of the catastrophic consequence of uh, nuclear weapons being used by one or the other. So I think both will be very cautious, but I think the danger does exist, yes. But Nuclear weapons have worked as a deterrent against war, with the risks, like you say, way too high for all sides involved. Has the mutually assured destruction doctrine been forgotten? Has the definition been changed, maybe? No, I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, the definition has changed, and certainly the reality has not changed. And I think an understanding of the reality is very important if you're not going to make a mistake that leads to nuclear use on either side. And I believe, from what I've seen on both sides, that the concern about the potential for the complete destruction of each country and the world is still very high. The problem is that as long as forces are on alert at a high level, there is always the possibility of a series of unexpected accidents that could lead to a nuclear exchange. And I think uh, that's the real danger. What happens hypothetically if there is a nuclear war? Uh, will a doctrine like the mutually assured destruction doctrine ever work again? Well, I think anybody who is rational and understands pretty much, you know, in a dim way, the consequences of nuclear weapons would not rationally use nuclear weapons. The problem is that if you have a crisis situation, where one or both sides have no understanding of what is actually happening on the other side, and people are exhausted because it has gone on over time, and somebody makes a, a bad decision with incomplete information, which is almost certainly what happens in the real world. Information is never complete. Uh, you could have uh, a massive use of nuclear weapons, and that, of course, would, would end civilization as we know it, and might, uh, although we can't be sure, but might actually end uh, human life on the planet. Um, you know, you've mentioned earlier that 
the nuclear war as it is is unlikely, but there's always a threat of an accident. And I've spoken to many political leaders, newsmakers like Noam Chomsky, Mikhail Gorbachev, and they also agree that a nuclear war is something nobody's willing to risk right now, but there is a danger of an accident involving nuclear weapons. What kind of accident can occur? Well, I can give you a concrete example and then expand on it. We, uh, in 1995, there was what's called a sounding rocket launched off an island um, that is on the northwest, uh, off the northwest coast of Norway. Now, this sounding rocket was different from other sounding rockets uh, that had been launched at that time. It went to much higher altitudes than uh, had previously uh, occurred. And it passed through the um, radar search fan of an early warning radar uh, at Olenogorsk in Russia and set off an alarm that uh, led to uh, Yeltsin uh, at that time being brought into the command loop. Now, I do not believe that Russia or the Russian military forces were put on high alert or would have uh, done anything uh, that could have led to an accident at that time. But if you had an accident like this, which occurred, for example, during a crisis between Russia and the United States, where both sides had been at loggerheads for quite a while, and both sides were exhausted, very concerned about military action happening, it could have led to uh, an alert and possibly even a launch of Russian or U.S. forces. So um, there is a concrete situation where uh, an accident that really must be looked at as benign given the circumstances under which it occurred could have been fatal under different circumstances. Now, the likelihood of something like that happening is low because you need uh, this accident to occur at a time of extreme crisis and you need the overlap. But the consequences, of course, would be uh, horrendous. Now, Ted Tell me something. Explain to an amateur, to me, how does one launch a nuclear weapon? Is it as easy as pressing a button? How long does it take for a nuclear missile to reach its target? Well, uh, typically uh, what uh, the United States and Russia have are several kinds of what are called ballistic missiles. They, uh, in the case of both Russia and the United States, we have land-based ballistic missiles, which uh, are in fortified underground missile silos so that they're protected to some extent from nuclear attack uh, or on submarines in the, in the uh, holds of submarines. And the ballistic missile would be uh, fired, uh, could be fired in uh, basically within uh, 50 or 60 seconds more or less of an alert being given to the operators. Uh, the warning time, the warning could take minutes to occur. That is, uh, the uh, Russia, Russian government or the American government could believe that an attack is underway. They could assess the situation and then collect information and then make a decision whether or not to launch. That could take 10 or 15 minutes. In the case of um, actually launching the rocket, that would take 40, 50, 60 seconds, maybe, more, again, more or less, depending on procedures, which are easily changed. The rocket would then ignite. It would fly out of its silo or its launch hole in, in, in the submarine. It would typically undergo powered flight for about between 150 and 300 seconds, depending on whether or not the rocket is what's called a solid propellant or a liquid propellant. So in one case, five minutes, the other case, maybe two and a half minutes. And then it would release warheads. The warheads would float in the near vacuum of space under the influence of gravity and momentum. And in about 20 to 25 or 28 minutes would arrive at their targets, re-enter the atmosphere and explode. So the world could be uh, basically finished off in uh, anywhere from a half hour uh, to an hour 
uh, upon the arrival of these warheads. Uh, people who think about these things generally expect, nobody really knows what to expect, but if you had a massive exchange, most nuclear warheads would be delivered in a very short time, probably within a half hour or an hour interval. Now, um, the bombs U.S. and Russia have Horrifying. in their arsenal. I'm sorry. The bombs that Russia and U.S. have in their arsenal right now, they're 100 times more powerful than the ones that were used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. How devastating would the aftermath of a nuclear explosion more be than today? Of, yeah, they're, they're more than hundreds of times uh, uh, more powerful. Um, a typical uh, warhead from uh, a Russian missile, uh, like what we call the SS-18, uh, the uh, one of those warheads, it carry, this rocket can carry up to 10 warheads. Um, uh, one of these warheads detonated over New York City, for example, one, would essentially destroy all of Manhattan, uh, most of uh, Staten Island, probably all of it, basically, large parts of New Jersey to the west, um, basically the borough of Brooklyn and uh, large part, most of Queens uh, and the Bronx, out to a range of uh, maybe uh, anywhere from, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, 10 kilometers range from the central area where it exploded. If you had a similar warhead uh, from the U.S. over Moscow, uh, it would destroy, again, uh, most of the city. Uh, it would, uh, again, uh, uh, destroy 150 square kilometers of the city easily. And that's only one warhead. There would be many warheads targeted on each of these great cities by the other side. On that scary note, uh, we're going to take a short break right now. When we come back, we'll continue talking to Dr. Yes. Theodore Postel, former advisor to the U.S. Chief of Naval Operations, MIT professor about the nuclear aspect of the global game of politics. Stay with us.